some denominations, like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, will only take communion with other members of that denomination. Like seriously, imagine having your whole religion be named after Missouri. Hey guys, welcome back to Kingdom Craft, where I build this big church in Minecraft while I talk about Christianity. Today, I'm working on my university here, and looks like everyone else showed up to watch me do this. So I'll say, hey guys. So yeah, this is the this is a real Christian Minecraft server. We all make churches together, and it's a place of fellowship across different denominations, which reminds me, that's what this topic is about. It's the topic of open communion versus closed communion. The question is, should Christians of different denominations take communion together? So basically, should your church offer communion to people who are not part of your denomination? So the open communion stance is basically, it's not that anyone can take communion at church, but it's basically if you're a Christian, if you're a baptized believer in Jesus, you can take communion. And most Presbyterian churches I've been to do open communion where the pastor will say before he does communion, before he uh, consecrates the elements, he'll just say, like, if you're a baptized believer in Jesus, if you've put your faith in Jesus, you're welcome to come to the table, because this isn't the Lord's table, this isn't the table of, I don't know, Grace Presbyterian Church. A lot of those churches are called Grace, it's just a generic name. So it's not the table of the, the Presbyterian Church, it's the table of the Lord. So if you're in Christ, if you're in the body of Christ, which is the church, the universal church, not a specific denomination, you can take communion. That's what people who believe in open communion believe. However, closed communion is the idea that you can only take communion if you're part of that specific denomination or a specific denomination that that denomination is in, like, full fellowship with. And generally Lutheran churches, especially the more conservative Lutheran denominations, like the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod or the Wisconsin Synod, and very specific ones have a practice of closed communion. Now, of course, the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches also practice closed communion, where you can only take a communion at a Catholic church if you're Catholic, but they're a bit more justified in doing so because they're like huge universal denominations, but come on, thinking the Wisconsin Synod Lutheran Church is the one true church, like they split over a bunch of things. The Wisconsin Synod people are even more radical than the Missouri Synod because the Missouri Synod Lutherans think that you can't take communion with people outside their denomination, but you can still fellowship with other, you can still fellowship with people outside your denomination in other ways, like praying with them. But the Wisconsin Synod Lutherans see no distinction between communion fellowship and prayer fellowship, so they won't even pray with anyone who is not a Wisconsin Synod Lutheran. And everyone else thinks that's pretty extreme. And the Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Synod basically agreed on all the theological issues, except that was the one issue they couldn't agree on is like whether or not they could pray with people outside their denomination. So uh, there's memes about how Lutheran synods, Lutheran churches, Lutheran denominations just always split off into a million pieces. So often Lutherans are just as schismatic as Protestants, they split they split apart just as much as Protestants, but they still have the one true church mindset of Catholics. And I'm just poking fun at my Lutheran friends. I love Lutherans. They're one of they're probably my second favorite tradition. But uh, I, I debate them sometimes, especially because Presbyterians often hold to open communion and Lutherans often hold to closed communion. So in this video, I'm going to be arguing for open communion, why I believe that is the biblical model of communion. And I just recently realized that this is my position after a debate I actually had with a Lutheran. So recently I debated on a Lutheran channel, I debated a Lutheran about the issue of the Reconquista. For those of you who don't know, the Reconquista in modern times is the movement to retake mainline Protestant churches because the mainline churches have largely abandoned the gospel and turned to theological liberalism instead. And I support the Reconquista, I support the movement to retake it, and I'm very involved in the Reconquista. However, a lot of people, most mostly Lutherans, there's some non-Lutherans who've said the same thing, but a lot of people have said the Reconquista is not only a bad idea, but it's actively sinful. Why would it be sinful to try and restore these denominations to Christ? Well, because they say in order to restore those denominations, you need to participate in those denominations, and that's communing with heretics. Now, 
what I would say in response, what I do say in response, what I said in the debate, is that you don't need to commune with heretics in order to be part of these mainline denominations because not all of the churches within the mainline denominations are heretical. Even though my denomination, for example, the Presbyterian Church USA, uh, has a lot of very liberal churches within it, churches that are liberal to the point of denying the essentials of the faith. I've met pastors in my own denomination who don't believe Jesus literally rose from the dead. And that's, of course, that's heretical. Of course, those people are not legitimate Christians because the fundamental claim of Christianity, the good news of the gospel, is Jesus rising from the dead. So Christians can agree to disagree on a lot of things, but not on the resurrection. So, of course, I would not commune with people like them if I would never go to a church run by one of those pastors. But there's also a ton of pastors in these mainline denominations who have spent their entire lives fighting the heresies like this. So, of course, it is fine to commune at those denominations, to worship and take communion. Sorry, not at those denominations, at those churches, to worship and take communion at churches like that where the people believe the gospel, where the gospel is preached, where the sacraments are rightly administered. However, a lot of Lutherans, particularly the ones that I was debating about the Reconquista, say even that is bad because they think that if you're taking communion in a denomination, even if your individual church is fine, if the denomination tolerates heresy, then you're communing with everyone in your denomination, including the heretical churches. So they think even if, like, even if my particular Presbyterian church is fine and affirms the gospel because it's part of the same broader organization as some other Presbyterian churches that do not affirm the gospel, that have gone astray from Presbyterian teaching and fallen to theological liberalism, they would say because of that, whenever I take communion at my Presbyterian church, I'm communing with all the other Presbyterian churches in the Presbyterian Church USA. So what they would say is that if I'm going to be a good Christian, I need to split off from my church. I need to join one of the more conservative Presbyterian denominations like the PCA or the OPC. And the reason I don't want to do that is because I want to reconquista my denomination to bring it back to Christ. So what we realized in the debate was the heart of this debate was a debate about open communion versus closed communion. Generally, people who favor open communion favor the Reconquista, and generally people who favor closed communion are against the Reconquista. And that's why most of the most vocal critics of the Reconquista are Lutherans. Now, luckily, Lutherans are the group, the Protestant group, that needs Reconquista the least because they still have a solid conservative denomination that's historically rooted. The Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, I just sort of joked about them, but they are a really solid conservative denomination. You could consider them mainline in some sense because they never split off from anyone. They're actually older than uh, a group that split off from them to form the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which the name is misleading. It's not an evangelical denomination, it's a very liberal mainline denomination, of which of course there's still conservative churches within it. But the LCMS has a lot of the old historic, you know, Lutheran churches and seminaries. So Lutherans of all the Protestant groups need Reconquista the least. So it works out that they're the ones who are least likely to support it because they're the ones, especially uh, Lutherans in those conservative Lutheran denominations, they're the ones who are most likely to hold to closed communion. So why is there this connection between the debate about communion and the debate about the Reconquista? Well. If you hold to open communion, like me, then you think communion unites you simply with all the believers all around the world. So I don't think communion unites you with your denomination. I think communion unites you with the body of Christ, with the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I'm using the lowercase c Catholic, meaning the universal church. So when I, when I take communion, I'm being united with all of the believers around the world, no matter what denomination they're a part of. And I think that when I am taking communion, I am not being united with people who are not true believers. So that means when I take communion, it is not an act of unity in any way with people within the denomination who might be heretical. Because, of course, I believe communion unites you to the body of Christ. Those who are part of the church outwardly, but deny the gospel, the deny that Jesus literally rose from the dead, they're simply not part of the body of Christ, so it's not a problem. However, those who hold to closed communion 
tend to think communion unites you to your denomination. Of course, they would also say it unites you to the body of Christ, but because they um, are very str What are these guys doing? They're just watching me. They're build my university here. Um, because they restrict communion to whatever denomination they are, it really is seen as an act of unity with your own denomination. People will say, like, is um, why am I communing at the altar of the PCUSA if the PCUSA tolerates heresy? Well, like I said, the altar at my Presbyterian church, it's not the altar of the PCUSA, it's an altar of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church with the, with the universal church. So the reason I favor open communion is pretty simple. Uh, two reasons, really. In 1 Corinthians, what St. Paul said is, the bread we break is it not a participation in the body of Christ. He didn't say, is it not a participation in this denomination. He said, is it not a participation in the universal body of Christ. And in saying that, I th when he was talking about the body of Christ, I think he was referring both to the literal body of Christ and to the church. Because the church is the body of Christ because it feeds on the body of Christ. It's sort of like a you are what you eat kind of thing. All Christians are united in Christ, and that's not just like a, a nice sounding metaphor. We are literally united in Christ by being part of Christ, and the way the church is made part of Christ is by feeding on Christ in the Lord's Supper. Now, I don't hold to transubstantiation, but I hold to spiritual real presence, so we spiritually receive Jesus in communion to be made more like him. So, it's still true that the church is all united in Christ, and St. Paul in 1 Corinthians said, the bread we break is a participation in the body of Christ, and the body of Christ means the church. The whole church, by feeding on the body of Christ, is united as the body of Christ here on earth. Another thing is, Paul also talked about divisions in the church, and there shouldn't be divisions among us, and saying you can only take communion if you're part of our denomination. That's the definition of creating divisions within the church. Now, I don't think it's a bad thing for there to be different denominations. I think it's better for there to be denominations than for churches to be non-denominational, because like I've said before, non-denominational is really infinitely denominational. You're not um, uniting the church, you're just further dividing every single individual into their own denomination. Denominations are a confession of unity around a set of beliefs. I think it's okay for there to be different denominations that believe different things, as long as they can still recognize each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And in some sense, they already do that. Because Catholics and Protestants, for example, will still recognize each other's baptisms. Like, if you're baptized, if you were baptized as a Catholic, you're baptized as a baby as a Catholic, and then you convert to the Presbyterian Church, you don't need to get re-baptized in a Presbyterian Church. We would recognize the Catholic baptism as valid, because it's still done in the name of the Triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Presbyterians uh, are very against re-baptism. I don't think you ever need to get re-baptized. Just as an aside, some people are like, oh, what if I was baptized as a baby, but I didn't really mean it then? It doesn't matter if you meant it or not, because baptism isn't a work of man, it's a work of God. But... Now, some Baptist churches will say if you were baptized as a baby, you need to get rebaptized, and I guess that's just a theological difference between me and them. I think all of them would say that, actually. Some Baptist churches would say you specifically need to get baptized in a Baptist church, but most of them, the majority of them that I've seen, don't say you need to get baptized in a Baptist church. They'll just say you need to get baptized as a believer. Some of them say, well, some of them will say it needs to be by immersion, but it's like, you guys don't think baptism does anything, so if it doesn't do anything, why does it matter? Anyway, this video is not about me attacking Baptists. I'm, at, I'm attacking Lutherans this time, not all Lutherans, and I'm not attacking them. I'm just showing why I disagree with closed communion. I think closed communion needlessly divides the body of Christ, but I will go into some reasons why I understand why they believe in closed communion, because the history of Lutheranism, and Jordan Cooper explains this well, is that whenever Lutherans unite with other denominations, they always lose their distinctively Lutheran beliefs and are pressured into adopting the beliefs of other denominations. Like, uh, the story they always bring up is in Prussia in, like, the 1800s. Uh, the Prussian government said that the Lutheran and Reformed churches needed to unite and become just united churches. And those churches ended up just being reformed churches. And the Lutherans actually ended up being persecuted for they, their beliefs. So they came to America, and that's how the LCMS, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, was founded. A lot of it was by Lutherans looking for religious freedom in America. 
So, of course, if they just fled persecution because they had to unite with Reformed Christians, then they're going to be a lot more picky about who they can specifically take communion with. So I get it, because I've noticed a similar thing um, uh, in the relationship between Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists. People are wondering, why are you so mean to Baptists? I'm fine if Baptists are like, yeah, we're Baptist, and that's something different than the Reformed tradition. But when Baptists try to call themselves Reformed and try to be part of the Reformed tradition, whenever Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists try to pretend like they're the same thing, then Presbyterians always end up losing our denominational distinctives and everything just becomes more Reformed Baptist. That's why even the Presbyterians who, like in Ligonier Ministries, who interact a lot with Reformed Baptists, I consider them like just Reformed Baptists who baptize babies but feel bad about it, who don't understand why. So that's, that's why I always say Reformed Baptists aren't Reformed. That's why I'm so obsessed with gatekeeping the Reformed tradition. Because I'm like, Baptists are cool, but if they start labeling themselves Reformed, then a lot of the truly Reformed doctrines, like baptismal efficacy, or spiritual presence in the Lord's Supper, or covenant theology, often end up getting discarded. So that's why I'm focused on gatekeeping who counts as truly Reformed, but I still would never gatekeep a Baptist from communion. Of course, I would take communion with Baptists. In the debate, I think uh, the, uh, the guy I was debating asked me, okay, well, would you take communion with a Baptist? And I was like, of course I would take communion with a Baptist, because even though they're wrong about infant baptism, they're my- okay, these guys are like sneaking up on me. They're still my brothers and sisters in Christ, so of course I'd take communion with Baptists. I would even maybe take a communion at a Baptist church, even though they don't believe the communion does anything, I still think it does something to them, even if they don't think it's doing anything to them. Because like I said, uh, the sacraments are a work of God, not a work of man. So even though I would gatekeep who gets to use the label truly reformed, I don't believe in gatekeeping communion from true believers. Now, I want to make an important distinction. We should gatekeep communion in some sense. We should gatekeep communion from unbelievers. There are some churches, mostly mainline Protestant churches, that have like completely open communion. I don't know if there's an official label for this, but basically they'll offer communion to absolutely anyone, whether they're a believer or not. And that is extremely dangerous because there's an explicit warning in 1 Corinthians that if you eat the Lord's Supper unworthily, and I just want to clarify, unworthily doesn't mean if you're a sinner. Some people will commit a sin and feel like they shouldn't take communion. No, that's when you need communion the most because we're not justified by works, but we are justified by faith. So if you don't have faith in Christ, it's dangerous to be to take communion and God might punish you for it. That's what the Bible says. The Bible said some literally died because they took communion in an unworthy manner. And of course, a lack of faith isn't the only way you could take it in an unworthy manner. If you maybe like disrespect the way the communion or you disrespect the elements, what the Corinthians were doing specifically is turning it into a gluttonous feast. And that was how they were disrespecting the sacrament of communion. But especially, the Westminster Confession of Faith says unbelievers must be kept from communion lest they bring damnation upon themselves. There is a real danger, because, like, we don't believe, as Calvinists, and this makes us different from Lutherans, we don't believe that if an unbeliever receives communion, they're really receiving the body of Christ. They're just receiving bread. When a, when a believer takes communion, they're receiving the real body of Christ, along with the bread. Hey, what was that sound? Did you guys hear that? Okay, when a believer takes communion, they're taking the they receiving the real body of Christ. But when an unbeliever takes communion, they're just receiving bread. Because we believe that Christ is spiritually present, but not physically present in the bread. And Lutherans believe that Christ is objectively present in, with, and under the bread and wine, even if it's an unbeliever that's receiving it. So because they believe that Christ is actually present in the bread, it does make sense why they would be more picky about who can receive it. But historically, both Presbyterians and Lutherans, and like everyone, has said that, yeah, if you're not a Christian, you shouldn't take communion. And this has been true across, you know, Baptists, Catholics, Presbyterians, Lutherans, Anglicans, Methodists, whatever. The practice of letting non-believers take communion is a very recent thing. And the first theologian I've heard about who has advocated for it is this guy Jürgen Moltmann. He's a little bit of an interesting guy in some other ways. He has been influential on the mainline church. And he has, like, one good idea that I think is very good, because he talks about how the gospel is, like, about the transformation of this world. But then again, he's not the only one who's ever talked about that. One of his worst ideas, 
Actually, no, this isn't even his worst. I, he has some ideas that are even worse than this, because I think he he's not even sure if God is all-powerful. But one of his worst ideas, this theologian Jürgen Moltmann, is inviting absolutely everyone to take communion, whether they're a believer or not, because he thinks that symbolizes like the radical inclusivity of Christ. He's kind of a liberal theologian. And a lot of churches have adopted that practice, thinking that, oh, the church needs to be a place of inclusivity, so communion should symbolize that, because, you know, Jesus always ate with the outcasts and stuff. Yeah, Jesus did do that, but not when he was doing the Lord's Supper. Jesus, in general, ate with sinners and prostitutes and everyone, but in general, but in the in the Lord's Supper specifically, he only ate with his disciples. He only ate it with other believers. So that uh, that fact is my argument against having communion being open to absolutely everyone. What is this guy doing? But the uh, Paul talking about participation in the body of Christ and the need for unity in the church. That's my argument for not doing closed communion for doing open communion all right guys thanks for watching this and i will see you all later bye